Welcome to today's MIT Star Forum on the Future of US-China Relations. I'm Taylor Fravel, Director of the MIT Security Studies Program and the Arthur and Ruth Sloan Professor of Political Science. We're delighted to have you join us today for this important discussion. I'd first like to thank our co-sponsors, the MIT Center for International Studies and the MIT Security Studies Program. I also want to point out to our viewers that we will have Q&A at the end of the talk. Please find a Q&A feature on the bottom of your toolbar. This is where you can type your questions and we will hopefully get to as many of them as possible. In addition, please pay attention to the chat feature also on the bottom toolbar where we will be sending out resource links such as bios, upcoming events, and other information that may be of interest to you. And now let me introduce to you our speakers, all of whom are graduates of MIT's Department of Political Science, and I'll introduce them in the order in which they will present. First, uh, Ke Tian Zhang, who received her PhD in 2018, is an assistant professor of international security in the Shar School of Policy and Government at George Mason University. She studies rising powers, coercion, economic statecraft, and maritime disputes and international relations and social movements in comparative politics with a regional focus on China and East Asia. Ali Wen, who received his SB in 2008, is a senior analyst with the Eurasia Group's macro, uh, excuse me, global macro practice, where he focuses on US-China relations and great power competition. He is the author of, of a forthcoming book, America's Great Power Opportunity, Revitalizing US Foreign Policy to Meet the Challenges of Strategic Competition. Finally, Eric Higginbotham, who received his PhD in 2004, is a principal research scientist at MIT Center for International Studies and the Security Studies Program. He is a specialist in Asian security issues. Before joining MIT, he was a senior political scientist at the RAND Corporation, where he led projects on China, Japan, and regional security issues. Please join me in welcoming uh, Ke Tian Zhang, who will speak to uh, the diplomatic aspects of the future of US uh, China relations. Katian, over to you. Great. Um, thanks, everyone. And it's really nice to uh, be back, although uh, virtually. Um, so, what I'm going to do today is that I'm going to um, uh, introduce to you very briefly some of the ish areas uh, in terms of US China relations so that we can have more um, conversations in the QA uh, session. So, um, there are several areas of tension uh, in regard to US-China relations. And the first one is probably on the mind of everyone, which is Sino-Russian relations in light of the current uh, affairs with regard to uh, Ukraine. Um, and then I'm gonna move on to uh, discuss the Winter Olympics, which uh, was just concluded about a week ago, and uh, as well as the current uh, COVID situation and finally at Taiwan. And Eric is going to speak more about um, the security aspects and military competition uh, uh, involving, in particular, Taiwan. And finally, uh, conclude with a little bit of more uh, uh, optimism with regard to a potential area of uh, uh, cooperation. So uh, in terms of the first issue area that may be of concern to um, the United States is obviously um, the uh, seemingly increasingly closer relationship between China and um, Russia. So in uh, just about a few weeks ago, China and uh, Russia signed a joint statement uh, which uh, reiterates their support for each other's core interests. So in the case of um, uh, uh, Russia, that's against NATO expansion and against color revolutions. And in regard to China's core interests, um, that is mostly against them, um, uh, both sides are against Taiwan's um, independence. And um, uh, in addition, um, both sides are against what's called a closed, according to them, closed alliance systems in the Asia Pacific region as well as um, opposes external forces undermining national security and interfer interfering with their internal affairs. So obviously the target here really is uh, the, um, the United States. And the United States was mentioned in uh, this uh, statement as well, um, especially with regard to the Indo-Pacific strategy. Um, in addition to this joint statement, China and uh, Russia actually signed uh, uh, many additional agreements, including a natural gas deals, which seems to me um, a, uh, a Russia strategy to find exit options in light of what might be happening with regard to uh, any sanctions involving uh, or regarding the Ukraine situation. So it seems that Russia is looking for an exit option uh, in terms of its natural gas uh, resources and China obviously will benefit from um, energy diversification. So that seems to be um, a strategy that, that the Russia is uh, currently adopting. 
Um, so you might wonder uh, what's, uh, whether uh, the current Ukraine situation is relevant and whether China, what China stance is on um, the, the, the current um, uh, Russian invasion of uh, Ukraine. Um, and China seems, although there is this joint statement, China is um, nevertheless quite uh, ambivalent about its um, stance. So Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi actually made uh, the statement that um, uh, every state's sovereignty is uh, every state sovereignty is independent, and Ukraine included, which seems to be uh, a warning against uh, the impending Russian uh, invasion. But at the same time, um, Chinese uh, Foreign um, Ministry spokesperson uh, Hua Chunying um, actually noted that um, uh, great powers should not be backed into a corner, uh, which indicates that um, China was uh, against NATO uh, ex expansion. So it remains to be seen um, what China's actual stance is in regard to uh, the current Ukraine situation. And um, uh, it might be something that um, uh, the, the Q&A uh, session will, um, uh, uh, will we'll discuss more about that in the Q&A Q &A session. And the next issue area uh, involves uh, uh, the Winter Olympics, which was just concluded. So um, many uh, officials around the world, including President Biden, um, boycotted the opening ceremony of the Winter Olympics on uh, the basis of China's human rights records, especially involving uh, uh, ethnic minorities such as uh, Xinjiang. So this creates a tension between China and the United States. And the Chinese government was quite uh, upset about this boycott. And um, uh, on the left-hand side of this uh, uh, picture, you see a um, Uyghur um, uh, minority athlete, Chinese athlete being the torch bearer of um, the Chinese um, uh, Winter Olympics uh, opening ceremony. Um, that's the lady on uh, the left. So this um, uh, Winter Olympics seems to be another issue area that suggests that human rights are still on uh, the table in terms of uh, creating potential tension between the two uh, states. And moving on to the third area of uh, attention, uh, which is the current uh, COVID situation. So there are two uh, issues uh, re revolving around the COVID um, um, uh, issue. Um, the first one is the uh, talk of war over Twitter, um, especially um, uh, as exemplified by um, Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesperson Zhao Yijian's uh, tweets. So he's one of Chinese uh, foreign ministry spokesperson and tweets uh, in official capacity on Twitter. And he's the one who uh, makes the unsupported argument that COVID started from um, the United States, especially it was a man-made virus for, uh, by uh, the US military. Um, so this uh, 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 wolf warrior diplomacy as uh, some uh, researchers would coin them um, has been creating attention uh, on the public diplomacy front between the United States and uh, China. And I would highly recommend um, everyone to read um, Peter Martin, who's a, a journalist at Bloomberg, who wrote a really fascinating book about um, the rationale for this uh, seemingly um, unprofessional behavior on the part of Chinese diplomats. And his argument is that um, a lot of it has to do with domestic po politics, i.e. to show allegiance to Chinese President Xi Jinping, as well as to appease the domestic uh, public. So the second area of contention really within COVID has to do with um, the, um, uh, the, the ongoing restrictions on both sides in terms of people-to-people um, -people exchange, especially in the format of um, um, air, um, air, air, airlines and flights. So in January, China uh, imposed harsh restrictions on U.S. airlines um, uh, incoming flights from the United States to China and the United States uh, Department of um, Transportation um, retaliated by uh, canceling all Chinese airlines uh, flights uh, into China. So currently, um, neither side has direct operating flights. So obviously, and this probably will go uh, into March, uh, especially um, until after the Chinese uh, winter, not the Chinese, the winter uh, Paralympics um, end. And this might not be uh, 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 obvious to you in terms of um, uh, uh, actual attention, but I think it's an area of concern because it limits people to people exchange, which might have a further dampening effect on the overall um, uh, health of US-China uh, relations. And 
Finally, um, the last area of uh, attention, obviously there are more uh, areas of uh, contention that, um, that I can cover here. And Eric will probably go more into detail about the security or military aspect of US-China relations. Uh, but the last area of concern obviously is Taiwan because it is one of China's core interests and more, uh, the most important one. And the example here is interesting because although China uh, coerced uh, Lithuania, uh, harshly for establishing the Taiwanese representative office, as you see here. But what's interesting that in the Chinese foreign ministry spokesperson's um, uh, uh, press briefing, um, she actually um, made a statement, a statement that um, um, external great powers were behind the behavior of Lithuania. So uh, apparently it was, uh, he was, she was really referring to um, the United States. So even in, it does show that in all of the matters surrounding Taiwan. China has the belief that it was really the United States, uh, which was behind a lot of um, uh, the actions that China deems as threatening its, um, uh, 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 its sovereignty over uh, Taiwan. So um, you might think that um, we've discussed quite a few areas of uh, tension, but is there a potential area of cooperation at all between China and the United States? Um, and I would venture a guess that climate change might be an area that both sides could uh, proceed. And especially since the Biden administration and um, the Chinese government did reach out in uh, last fall with regard to uh, combating climate change, but because of the aforementioned four areas of tension, um, the current uh, climate change cooperation between the two states seemed to be put on um, hiatus. So just to briefly conclude um, so that we can move on to uh, the more fascinating errors about US-China economic and uh, military relations, um, I would conclude that the most serious concern between the United States and China is still uh, Taiwan. Um, and at the same time, there is uncertainty surrounding the new Sino-Russian joint statement with regard to how committed each side, each, both sides are with regard to their respective core uh, interests. And human rights issue, although not always uh, the most important, uh, in terms of US-China relations still remains on the table as a potential point of contention. And uh, diplomatic tension, of course, is really a reflective of the overall economic and security competition. And uh, finally, and unfortunately, domestic politics in both China and the United States might actually make it even harder for cooperation and negotiation to come into uh, fruition. So with that, um, I uh, will close my uh, uh, slides and um, I look forward to the discussion. Chen, thanks so much. Uh, next, uh, we have uh, Ali Wen, who's going to discuss uh, the economic uh, dimension. Ali, over to you. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Taylor. Uh, I wish we were doing this event uh, in in person, but hopefully, uh, hopefully next time we'll we'll do this event uh, in person. But it's really an honor to uh, to be here uh, virtually uh, back in my my alma mater. And I told uh, I hope I told Taylor in advance, and, and I, I hope that he'll. To allow a, a slight recasting of, of what I intend to present. So I'm going to talk about some of the economic dimensions of competition, but what I really want to talk about is, I think, a, a really critical element of competition, which is uh, narratives, stories, uh, you could almost say plot lines. And that is to say, there's there's obviously, there are many, there are many elements or many dimensions to competition between uh, the United States and China. There are, there are military elements, there are economic elements, there are diplomatic elements, uh, ideological elements. And I think that if you kind of add them all up, um, I think that there's kind of a competition of what stories or narratives the two countries are trying to tell themselves, uh, what narratives are trying to convey to one another, and what narratives or stories or plot lines are trying to convey uh, to the rest of the world. And I think that, and so I'll talk a little bit about some of the narratives that I think are, are gaining traction within uh, China, some of the narratives that are gaining traction within the United States, and I'll offer a few sort of reflections on those. Uh, I do think that in China, and I, I realize that when you when you refer to any country kind of in a monolithic way, you're necessarily going to be oversimplifying and reductionist. So I, I apologize for that in advance. But just for simplicity's sake, um, I do think that in China, when you look at commentary by uh, Chinese international relations scholars, when you look at statements by uh, Chinese officials, you do get a sense that as time passes, there's more of a sense of, at least externally, more of a sense of confidence in the narratives that are being promulgated. And I think we just saw the conclusion of the Winter Olympics and you know, the Olympics, uh, they're kind of a, a point for taking stock of, of a country's power, of a country's influence and the host country is really telling something uh, about itself. And I think it's interesting to look at the narratives that China was trying to convey in 2008 versus those it was trying to convey in this year, in 2022. I think that the narratives that are increasingly taking hold are, are two, and they are mutually reinforcing, they're interlocking. 
The first narrative is that China is increasingly, if not inexorably, resurgent, and that the United States, its principal strategic competitor, is terminally declining. Now, I should say that those two narratives, the narratives themselves are not new, but I think that the prominence that they occupy in uh, in high-level Chinese discourse, and I think that the centrality that they now occupy in the Chinese foreign policy establishment, I think that those elements are different. So in 2008, uh, in the aftermath of the global financial crisis, he started seeing some percolation of this narrative that perhaps maybe the global financial crisis is sort of a real sign that the United States is about to embark on a period of terminal decline. So you started seeing some discussion in that vein, uh, but there was a lot of pushback uh, within, I think among Chinese officials, among Chinese scholars who said, well, perhaps, but it's, it's premature. Uh, China, in terms of its aggregate national power, it's nowhere near the United States. The United States is resilient, it bounces back. And what we've started to see over the years you know, with the global financial crisis, uh, with the, the vagaries and really the bitterness of America's domestic politics, with America's response to the pandemic, and then just objectively with China's growing economic power, I think in particular, it's growing economic power relative to that of the United States, it's growing technological capacity. We're starting to see these narratives about inexorable Chinese resurgence and terminal American decline. Uh, they really move center stage. They used to, I think, kind of occupy more of a fringe position in, in high level discourse, and I think that they really now have moved a uh, center stage. Um, and then I think in the United States, in terms of some of the narratives about China that have taken hold, I at least, you know, for one, and, and I'd, I'd be curious what everybody else thinks, I at least when I, I sort of consume the news and I, and I look at the op-ed pages, I experience kind of something of an analytical kind of, you know, whiplash. So I'll, I'll wake up in the morning and I'll read a commentary about how you know, China is on this kind of this glide path to global hegemony. And then before I go to sleep, I'll read another commentary saying that China inexorably is going to succumb to the contradictions between globalization and authoritarian rule. And that perhaps it's, it's been more of a potent challenger uh, than the United States has ever faced, but it, it will in time collapse due to internal contradictions. Well, those are obviously very difficult predictions to reconcile. So is China poised for global preeminence or is it at some point uh, bound to collapse? Um, and the point that I, I really want to make in talking about these, these narratives that you see taking hold in, in China, these narratives that you see taking hold in, in the United States, I think that there's something misguided really in, in all of those narratives. Uh, but they've gained a lot of traction. And I think they're gaining more traction uh, amid discussions of a great power competition uh, between Washington and Beijing, amid discussions of the prospect of a new Cold War uh, between the two countries. Now, when you think of competition, so whether you know, strategic competition, great power competition, but when you hear the word competition, uh, there, I think most people would say there are winners and there are losers. Uh, that's how we sort of conceive of competition. And similarly, when we talk about a new Cold War, you know, whatever your, your judgments are on, on the merits or the limits of that analogy, but when we think of the Cold War, we know how the Cold War ended. The Cold War ended decisively with the implosion of one of the competitors, namely the Soviet Union, and it imploded in quite dramatic fashion in December of 1991. And so when we think about, again, competition, new Cold War, sort of the, the terminology, the frameworks that we use to conceptualize a relationship, we think about winners and losers. Um, and I think that that's why these narratives around sort of you know, China being inexorably resurgent or China potentially collapsing, you know, Washington, prevailing or Washington being in terminal decline, I think those narratives, they feed into this notion and are reinforced by this conclusion that this competition will resolve itself decisively, that even if we can't quite articulate what victory would mean in this bilateral context, that one country will eventually come out on top. Um, and, and I would submit that I think that that conclusion is misguided. I think that neither the United States nor China is likely to achieve a decisive victory over the other. I think that they will have to, to coexist, to cohabitate, whatever your preferred uh, choice is. Um, and that reality is, is challenging for policymakers. Um, it's how do you prepare for an ambiguous condition? How do you strategize for an ambiguous condition that you have to sustain in perpetuity? If you, if you come to the conclusion that your principal strategic challenger isn't going to disappear, but it's going to endure, what do the parameters of coexistence look like? And I suspect that you might be able to get some agreement between U.S. and Chinese interlocutors about the imperative of cohabitation, but I imagine that U.S. interlocutors would have a different conception of what cohabitation means or what it in, uh, uh, entails, and similarly with Chinese uh, interlocutors. But I think that the precondition, I think that really the fundamental precondition for strategic stability between the United States and China is that recognition that neither country is going to be able to achieve a decisive victory, however one conceptualizes it. Neither country is going to be able to decisively overwhelm the other, 
because each has unique competitive advantages that the other can't readily replicate. Um, so that's that's kind of the, the sort of the top line judgment that I want to convey. Um, and then I'll I'll just offer a few thoughts about what I think are some of China's uh, competitive advantages, what I think are some of its competitive liabilities, and why when you conduct kind of a, a net assessment of sorts on China's competitive assets and liabilities, you know why I think that the United States should think of China not as poised for global preeminence, not as poised for a dramatic Soviet-style disintegration, but, but poised to be an enduring challenger, but a manageable one. So in terms of competitive assets, so uh, you know, Eric is going to talk you know, in, in certainly in much more granular detail about the military elements of competition. But certainly, if you look at where China was in 1995-96 you know, with the Taiwan Strait crisis, if you look at China's military modernization in the intervening decades, it's been a very sweeping modernization. And Whereas 25, 30 years ago, most observers, you know, there wouldn't have been much of a debate in a hypothetical scenario involving a Taiwan contingency, would the United States or China militarily prevail? There wouldn't have been that much debate in 1995 or 1996. And of course, in the Taiwan Strait crisis in 95, 96, uh, in, in response to China's uh, coercion vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan, uh, the Clinton administration dispatched two aircraft uh, carrier battle groups to the Taiwan Strait. China, uh, China backed down, and that really humiliating outcome, it was an impetus for China's military modernization. So, so China's military modernization, it's been sweeping, it's proceeding apace uh, economically, uh, and getting back to what my original remit uh, for my remarks was supposed to be, I think that China's resurgence is most pronounced in the economic dimension. You know, here is, you know, we're, we're marking the 50 year anniversary of Richard Nixon's opening to China. I mean, in 1972, when you think about, you know, China is in the throes of the Cultural Revolution, highly isolated, highly impoverished. Um, and if you think about China's economic progress in the intervening half century, it's one could argue that there really isn't any other precedent. It's, it's really staggering. Uh, China now presides over the world's second largest economy. Uh, despite sort of the COVID-induced uh, COVID uh, slowdown, uh, deceleration in its growth, despite sort of China's crackdown in big technology companies, I think the most forecasts suggest that China's economy will overtake America's in aggregate size well before the middle of the century. Uh, China is increasingly a source of innovation in its own right. So economically and technologically, again, its, its, uh, its progression has been very uh, impressive. And I think that when you put together its military modernization, you put together its economic progress, its technological progress, um, it really does feed into those narratives that I was talking about earlier, this notion that perhaps China is on this inexorable path. And the reason that I keep emphasizing narratives is there's, there's the objective strategic balance between the United States and China, and, and observers can disagree on what that objective strategic balance is, but narratives matter, perceptions matter. Um, how middle powers perceive that strategic balance between the United States and China uh, matters. So if you, are, if you are a middle power trying to figure out how you balance your relationships with the United States and China, if you accept the narratives or if you, if you buy into the narratives that are increasingly being promulgated by China's leadership, even if you have significant apprehensions about Beijing's conduct, you might say to yourself, I see the writing on the wall, I see where the global strategic balance is shifting, and so even if I have apprehensions about China's conduct, I need to start making accommodations. So there's the actual strategic balance, however you assess it, and then there's a perception of the strategic balance. So I think that China does have a lot of competitive advantages in its favors, and, and I think narrative momentum being the most powerful of them, but it also has competitive liabilities. And, and I, I'll, I'll conclude after discussing some of these competitive liabilities. Um, I think many of them are familiar to, you know, to all of us. If you look internally, whether it's China's demographic outlook, which is quite bleak, you look at uh, accumulating environmental degradation, uh, you look at an increasingly inefficient model of growth. So China has many structural difficulties internally, but I think that the real critical Achilles heel, the real constraint on China's long-term trajectory is this gap between its economic uh, gravitational pull, you sometimes hear that term, uh, this gap between its economic gravitational pull on the one hand and the narrative momentum that's generated by that gravitational pull, and China's growing estrangement from the advanced industrial democracies that, while not collectively as preponderant as they were, say, at the turn of the century, nonetheless still do wield the balance of global military and economic power. Uh, and it's quite dramatic. If you look at China's so strategic position prior to the onset of the coronavirus pandemic, um, it was, I think, you could argue much more favorable than it is today. So prior to the onset of the coronavirus uh, pandemic, uh, the Quad was kind of limping along. It, it wasn't able to make this transition from analytical abstraction and a geopolitical construct. Uh, the economic relationship between China and the European Union was flourishing and negotiations over the comprehensive agreement on investment were proceeding apace. Um, and I think that China really felt, and particularly with, with the convulsions that the United States was experiencing as a result of the pandemic, there was really, really a sense that 
again, these narratives that were percolating. And I think that what we're starting to see now, if you look at the picture today, uh, the Quad has a new lease on life and is proceeding with clear momentum. You look at the signing of AUKUS, uh, the comprehensive agreement on investment. Uh, it's now, uh, its ratification prospects are uncertain. Uh, Brussels is undergoing a fundamental recalibration of its disposition vis-a-vis -vis Beijing. And of course, the US-China relationship itself is, is deteriorating. And so if, the, if China isn't able to establish, or I guess I should say restore a baseline of trust with those advanced industrial democracies, it's difficult to believe that just on the basis of economic heft alone, that China will be able to overcome that gulf in trust. And so China, it has many competitive assets, some of which I outlined, but I think it has a critical Achilles heel. Uh, some of them are internal, but I think the major one is this gap between its economic pull and the diplomatic distrust that it's engendering. And so for that reason, I think that it's imperative for the United States to think about China not as poised for global preeminence. I think that that could uh, sow consternation, not to think that China is poised for collapse, that could induce complacence, but to think of China as an enduring competitor, a manageable one, but an enduring one. And China similarly, I think it behooves the leadership in China to think of the United States as an enduring competitor. And so then the real question I think for all of us is, as we reflect on the 50 year anniversary of President Nixon's visit to China and think about the next 50 years, what do the parameters of competitive coexistence look like for those two countries? Thanks. Great, Ali, thank you so much. Uh, now turning uh, uh, the floor over uh, to Eric Higginbotham to discuss the military dimension. Eric, over to you. Thanks, Taylor, and thanks, uh, Ali. Um, all your language of narratives here. Um, if we're talking about uh, narratives on the military side, over the last several months, there have been something approaching a war panic over Taiwan and pressures to change US-China uh, policy, specifically uh, on the Taiwan issue, um, to make more unambiguous security assurances or guarantees for Taiwan. Now, much of this is driven by uh, dire warnings about uh, shifts in the military balance of power. My own view is that uh, much of this rhetoric is overblown. So I'll discuss today uh, China's military modernization, uh, the military balance, and what I think are the implications for the United States and US-China policy. Um, I should say I prepared these comments before last night. So uh, I think we'll have a lot to talk about in terms of the implications of, uh, of Russia's invasion today. All right, to understand priorities in Chinese military modernization, it's, it's necessary to think about the uses to which military power might be applied. Um, second, only to maintaining the Communist Party's grip on power. China's core national interests uh, include the defense of sovereignty and national unity. Um, China has disputes uh, with a number of states uh, over islands and maritime rights in the South China Sea and the East China Sea and over parts of its border with India. The most significant dispute that it has is over the status of Taiwan, which it views as a wayward or renegade uh, province that by rights uh, is an integral part of China. The PLA is not uh, always the most important means of advancing Chinese interests in those areas, but it can be used to demonstrate presence or peacetime control uh, of contested areas during peacetime. Uh, to pressure or coerce states to cede ground, either literally or figuratively and to demonstrate the capability to resolve issues more decisively through the use of lethal force if necessary. Um, two additional points here. Uh, first, whereas the primary tasks of the Chinese military, the PLA, during the Cold War was the defense of continental areas, which required large land forces, many of the tasks today are primarily air and uh, maritime in nature. And second, uh, the major contingencies are around China's periphery. So all those areas I mentioned are around China's periphery. So the power projection requirements uh, for China are more limited than they might be, certainly more limited than those for the US military. China needs some type and extent of power projection capability, but the requirement is bounded. A couple of important caveats are worth mentioning. Uh, Hu Jintao announced new historic missions for the PLA in 2004. Uh, sparking debate on other types of tasks, including the protection of Chinese interests and nationals overseas and, and uh, the possible protection of China's sea lines of communication. And second, the increased range of conventional weapons uh, today, particularly missiles, is forcing the PLA um, to consider more, a more distant uh, or a deeper buffer zone. So even if China just had eyes for Taiwan, um, it will have to influence events farther east, lest an adversary launch uh, counterattacks or counterstrikes from there. 
So overall, the Chinese military is generally focused on its immediate periphery, but that focus is being somewhat attenuated uh, by more complex tasking and the evolution of technology. All right, on to Chinese military modernization. After two decades of declining budgets, the PLA's fortunes changed pretty dramatically after 1996. That was really an inflection point. From 1996 to about uh, the mid 2010s, annual uh, budget growth surpassed 10% a year in real inflation adjusted terms. Since then it slowed somewhat, uh, but has nevertheless been a little over 7% for each of the last several years. So Chinese defense spending in 2020 was about 600 plus percent of what it was in 2000, again, in inflation adjusted terms. And by way of comparison, the US defense uh, budget increased by about 70% over that period. So um, as Ollie mentioned, there's been a dramatic relative change in spending at least, though US spending remains in absolute terms uh, several times that of China. All right, to review in sequence what China has done with that new money, um, it initially focused on what might be called denial capabilities. Those are capabilities designed to frustrate the ability of US or other forces to operate in the theater. Um, those included land-based missiles, air defenses, and submarines, and it had a pretty good start on developing all those capabilities by about 2000. China's uh, conventionally armed missiles are particularly notable. They can do immense damage to fixed installations like, like air bases and the aircraft located on them or uh, naval bases. And they also include anti-ship ballistic missiles. Now, that those were the first in the world uh, and they can strike ships at sea, at least in theory, um, though the targeting problem uh, would be difficult. During the 2000s, uh, China also began serious production of warplanes and smaller naval ships, mostly frigates and corvettes. And then by about the 2010s, the mid 2010s, it moved on to the production of larger naval ships, destroyers, cruisers, and aircraft carriers. That naval buildup is continuing at what might be called a, a furious pace today with, Chinese, um, uh, with China building new surface combatants faster than the United States. Uh, most recently, it's moved to address remaining capabilities gaps. So it's addressing anti-submarine warfare weaknesses, command and control and sustainment, things like aerial refueling and, uh, at, uh, and underway replenishment ships. And of course, um, China has also built robust electronic warfare, cyber, space, and counter space capabilities. So it really has the full gamut today. Now, when you're talking about Chinese military modernization, uh, you, know, you can talk about the glass half full, in other words, the advances that have been made or the glass half empty, um, as each of those achievements uh, or advances that I just mentioned comes with caveats. So Chinese production of fifth generation or you know, stealthy aircraft has been slowed by continuing problems in engine production. Its fourth generation fighters have lagged in the installation of high-end electronics. For those hobbyists out there, AESA radar and ground attack capabilities. And while China's Navy has made enormous strides in producing powerful surface combatants, its submarines remain relatively noisy. Beyond that, its actual inventory is thinner in some areas than others. It's produced only a handful of nuclear powered attack submarines and to date at least uh, two medium sized aircraft carriers, although another is building. And at least currently it lacks uh, the uh, amphibious lift for a full invasion of Taiwan. All right, command arrangements and training two are areas where one can either look at prog progress or at current standards, which re remain somewhat problematic. Overall, the improvements in uh, these aspects of sort of military software have not matched the improvements in military hardware. Um, some would argue it's harder to change organizational culture and practice than it is to buy uh, new toys. And I think I would agree with that assessment. Uh, so some achievements that are noted in the, in the Chinese media are surprising uh, really because they're fairly pedestrian, at least by US standards, um, than because they're truly remarkable. So you have, for example, China's uh, media noting the first eight hour fighter sortie, which is something that US pilots have done regularly in actual combat for many years. Um, is it exhausting? Absolutely, but it's sort of done as a matter of course um, within the US military. All right, so where does this leave the US and the region? Um, I'd make four points. 
first, uh, Chinese military capabilities greatly outstrip those of other regional states. Actually, if you can flip back one slide to the comparison with Japan there. Um, China's military budget is about five times that of Japan's, and I would use Japan here as the point of comparison since it has the region's second largest budget. You can see from the slide that uh, Japan's military inventories are smaller than China's, and despite Japan's impressive technological base, its equipment is not uniformly superior to China's in quality. Much of Japan's military equipment is of an earlier generation, and it's not adequately modernized the older systems uh, in its inventory. So while the best Japanese military systems are superior to China's, the bulk of the force structure, I would say, is inferior. The comparison to the US is quite different, if I can get the slide here. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the US military budget remains several times that of China, and its force structure has been established over decades, as well as its expertise. In many of the most important areas, including fifth generation aircraft, nuclear submarines, and large warships, the US uh, maintains a significant qualitative uh, advantage, I'm sorry, quantitative advantage. And for the most part, quality is also superior, um, in some cases, very markedly so. So everything I say today will have caveats. You can't really discuss capabilities without considering the circumstances of their use. War is not a sporting event uh, where the venues or at least the playing field is neutral. So a second set of points has to do with geography. Uh, the respective distance of China and the United States to Taiwan or other potential flashpoints uh, uh, in Asia obviously favors China. Uh, if you can flip the slide, please. About 10% of US naval and air forces are based in the Western Pacific. This excludes Hawaii, but just the Western Pacific, Japan and Guam. The rest can flow into the theater, um, but San Diego is about 11,000 kilometers from Taiwan and, and moving forces in large numbers would require weeks. A second set of geographical considerations has to do with the interactions of, of, of local geography and technology, and that really operates in a very different way here. The geography of Asia, I think it's important to, to stipulate, does not favor wholesale invasion by one state against another. Uh, given the same defense budgets, it should be easier to defend against invasion than to undertake one. The terrain, uh, the, the geography between China and most of its near neighbors is poor for attack. There are no rolling plains here uh, or gentle hills as there are in the Ukraine. Most of these areas include major water barriers or jungles or high mountains. Amphibious invasion is particularly hazardous. So those uh, cases with water barriers are particularly difficult from China's perspective. If we look back at the Falklands War, Argentina was able to delay a British naval landing by three weeks um, with just six anti-ship missiles. And it's now possible to buy those missiles by the hundred. So last year, Taiwan purchased 400 Harpoon anti-ship missiles. It's a very impressive inventory. And the United States is buying missiles by the thousands. It'll buy 10,000 of a single type, the CHASM, uh, by about 2032. So I think what Ali said is absolutely true. Um, you know, we're not talking about sort of an absolute standard of superiority here. Again, with caveats, um, when you look at technology, uh, it doesn't all work in one direction. Uh, land attack missiles e equalize the offense-defense balance to an extent. With land attack missiles, you no longer have to cross water to destroy or damage air bases and ports. Um, and also, uh, you know, it's worth noting that a blockade strategy could be effective. Overall, however, uh, the combination of terrain and technology favors the defense. Really though, the million dollar question is how much material disadvantage te technology and geographic factors can offset. So even if you accept the notion that the defense provides its advantages, to what extent can it tip the scales? So looking back at historical cases, in, 19, in 1940, Britain was on the defense, uh, managed to prevail in the Battle of Britain, despite the fact that its aggregate power was somewhat less than Germany's. But Britain in that case was able to produce fighters at about the same rate of Germany. Japan's economy today is about a third that of China's and Taiwan's is about 1 20th. So obviously neither of those states is gonna be capable of producing forces nearly the size of China. 
And there's reason then to doubt um, whether defensive advantages alone can offset those types of asymmetries in, in national power. Finally, a third broad point is that geographic material and political considerations also make it difficult for Asian states to assist one another. So there's growing uh, security cooperation between these states, but no formal alliances, certainly nothing like NATO. And they're not in any case contiguous like the states of NATO, but distributed around uh, the per perimeter of China. Okay, so finally, based on all this, I think we can conclude a few things. First, the US remains indispensable to regional security. And second, together with other regional states, the US should be capable of balancing Chinese power for at least the next decade and potentially uh, longer. Now, I'd use the word balance here fairly literally. We're not talking about uh, decisive US military dominance in areas close to China. If there were to be a conflict, without doubt, US losses would be high based on my own uh, wargaming experience. You know, I think we could imagine that the US could lose several hundred aircraft if China struck um, bases in Japan, for example, and potentially a couple of aircraft carriers, 10 or 15 destroyers, thousands of, of soldiers or sailors and airmen, all in the span of a fairly short, sharp conflict. Um, so in other words, at least in the air and on the water. This would be a bigger fight than anything seen since World War II or <clears throat> potentially since this morning. Uh, we can talk about that. Um, but overall, I think the risk to China in any sort of ambitious military action like an invasion of Taiwan would be extraordinary. Such an attack would produce, um, could produce, not just uh, catastrophic military failure with thousands of uh, prisoners on Taiwan, but also bring enormous political risk. Moreover, if China conducts any sort of realistic wargaming, which I think it does, then the risk should be fairly evident to be Beijing. So if all this is generally true, then I think there are a few uh, implications for US policy. Um, great power war in Asia is possible, but I think it would most likely involve one of two possible paths. The first would be miscalculation. If China believes that uh, the prospect of US casualties would deter Washington from intervening, Beijing could pursue a course from which it would be difficult to withdraw if the United States did in fact participate or intervene. The other path I think is if Beijing is left uh, only with alternatives that look worse than the risk of military action. So this could occur, for example, if Taiwan declared legal independence or if the United States recognized Taiwan as an independent state. Um, such events I don't think would necessarily lead to war, but they could. Um, so all of, you know, I think my bottom line here is that the peace is for us to lose. It's not something that otherwise is an immediate jeopardy simply from the shifting balance of power. So we should behave as a confident major power. We should continue to abide by our agreements with China on Taiwan and on other issues. We should maintain our policy of strategic ambiguity, um, neither committing in advance to fight for Taiwan, but making it clear that we might in the event of an unprovoked attack. And we should engage China and look for ways to cooperate with it on the large set of issues that are not zero sum. Finally, um, you know, I think we should continue to maintain powerful military capabilities. We may or may not be able to maintain the defense budget where it is today, but I don't think, um, uh, but I don't think we should cut it uh, too deeply. So I do have some regrets about focusing so much on Taiwan, um, since I know that's an extremely complicated issue and military dimensions are only one aspect, uh, but I'll stop and let others take me to task on, on that or anything else. Thanks. Great. Um, thanks so much, Eric, and uh, uh, Katen and Ali as well. Um, what I wanted to do is uh, briefly throw some questions uh, back uh, the three of you and then open it up uh, to the Q&A that we've got in the queue. Um, let me start with Ali. Ali, uh, can you help us understand what the parameters of coexistence uh, would be? Um, so it comes up a lot. It, it's come up in occasional statements from uh, the White House. It's come up in writings by previous writings by currently serving officials. But what would the United States and China 
each have to recognize and respect uh, in terms of interests of the other for there to be a durable and stable uh, coexistence between the two. Thanks, Taylor. And I, I'm going to give this, I, I hasten to note that I'll give a very impoverished answer just because this is, it's, I think you've asked the fundamental question and I, I certainly won't pretend to have any, um, anything particularly enlightened to say, I guess I'll just kind of revert back to something that I said in, in my opening remarks. It's not clear to me that the United States and China have converged on what I think is actually just the fundamental. So, so even assuming that we, even assuming that Washington and Beijing could agree on some parameters for what competitive coexistence would look like. So I, I imagine you could get some U.S. and Chinese interlocutors to agree in the abstract that that's, that's the desired steady state. They would have some disagreements over what would constitute it. But it's not even clear to me that the two countries have converged on what I would argue is the fundamental precondition for going down the path that would lead you to competitive cohabitation or competitive coexistence. And that is accepting that the United States and China, they're unlikely to undergo the kind of power transition that we're accustomed to thinking about and that they're much more likely to, to endure, to cohabitate. Um, and I think that that's why I, I mentioned in my opening remarks, I think that if we think too much, if we conceptualize the relationship too much in terms of, let's say, great power competition or a new Cold War, I think a lot of the frameworks that we use, and these are frameworks that I, I think are, they've gained a lot of traction in both capitals. You know, as I said in my remarks, these frameworks, they incline you to think about decisive victories rather than ambiguous conditions or rather than steady states. And so again, when you think about a competition, you think about victors and losers. When you think about a Cold War, um, I think that one of the reasons that the, sort of the Cold War is sort of, newly, uh, sort of newly in vogue or newly fashionable, I think for two reasons. One, it furnishes America's only example of long-term sort of strategic contestation. Uh, and I, I think that there's, when you sort of have an N equals one, you're gonna milk that N equals one for, for as much as you can get. Um, but it also, I think that it puts policymakers in a somewhat familiar or comforting frame of mind. Um, and since we are, since I mentioned the Cold War, you know, one, you know, one article that I found myself revisiting just over and over and over again, and I think it's very instructive in thinking about competitive coexistence. It's by George Kennan, you know, no less than the architect or at least the sort of the, uh, the figurehead of containment himself. Um, so if you'll just sort of allow me to sort of a, a brief digression, but I, I think that it's, it's uh, I, I at least find it illuminating. Um, so George Kennan, uh, he, he gave a speech at the Council on Foreign Relations on the occasion of, uh, of his 90th birthday, so it's 1994, and the council invited him to, to reflect on containment. So this is kind of the heady 1990s, there's a lot of triumphalism, the Soviet Union has collapsed, and I think that a lot of, I think a lot of the members of Kennan's audience expected that he would deliver, and I think that he would have been probably justified in delivering a triumphal address. Here is you know, the, the doctrine of containment that I helped to articulate that Granted, it's been, it's been implemented differently across administrations, but it's guided US policy for the better part of half a century. Here I am being asked to reflect on the doctrine that I helped to enunciate. Um, and instead of delivering the kind of the triumphalistic address that I think many of those in attendance expected that he would deliver, um, he gave a much more measured a kind of sober address. And he said, he issued a warning to, to his audience. He said that for the past 60 years, so the speech is in 1994, so dating to the 1930s, he said that for the better part of the past 60 years, US foreign policy has been so preoccupied with dealing with frontal overt existential challengers and achieving decisive victories that it actually doesn't know how to orient itself in the absence of that overarching existential challenger. And so he warned his audience about the possibility of strategic grit. He warned of the possibility that absent the Soviet Union, which had guided US foreign policy, that US foreign policy might succumb to strategic sort of drift or disorientation. Um, and I bring up that example to say that when we, when we talk about great power competition or a new Cold War, I think part of, part of those invocations, I think it's partly, can we put ourselves in a frame of mind that allows us to think about a decisive victory? Um, and again, with, this, with the Cold War, the Soviet Union, it collapsed. So we know who won, the United States, we know who lost. Um, but I, so I, it's, it's all a long-winded way of saying, and I, I wanted to invoke George Kennan's uh, his speech that he gave in 1994 to say, that before the two countries can even have a conversation about what competitive cohabitation would look like, and I would have to imagine that both countries would have different interpretations of what its pillars would be, the pathway of getting there, they have to both agree, uh, get away from notions of 
decisive victory, decisive loss, and think more about accepting each other as enduring realities. It's not clear to me that they've converged upon that recognition, but in order for them to have any hope of traversing that path, they have to first accept that basic condition. Great, thanks, Ali. Um, Katana, Eric, anything you'd like to add on the parameters of coexistence? Um, great, yeah, thanks, Taylor. Um, I, I just wanted to maybe add real quick that I absolutely agree with Ali, and in particular in the sense that I, I, I feel like the bottom of the issue in terms of US-China competition might not necessarily be just the pure capability uh, aspect, but more so with domestic um, uh, politics and the narrative that, that Ali mentioned uh, were centered on in uh, his presentation, and that is both on the part of China and um, the United States. So there are certainly people, I think, at least from, from, from my understanding, um, both in China and the United States that actually believe in the need for coexistence because it's a globalized production and supply chain. And, and they are aware of the facts that one cannot dominate the entire production supply chain. It's just near, nearly impossible. If you ask the economists, both in China and the United States, they'll probably agree. But the politicians, not so much. And I think really it's the narrative where sort of the domestic politics and that have been uh, a major hurdle in uh, this regard. Great, thanks. Eric? Well, I agree with both Kutian and Ali, so I don't have too much to add. I will say, you know, if we think about great power competition and the possibility of war, since I'm uh, handling the military topics here, uh, I will say that, uh, you know, even though we may be back to an era, you know, of great co power competition or more resembling great power competition than, than we've experienced since the end of the Cold War, there is an enormous difference um, between today and the pre-nuclear era. We can never have a war that decisively settles any of the issues on the table, particularly in Asia. So, you know, it, it only sort of uh, kicks the can down the road, but under circumstances that are much more contentious and confrontational. So, uh, you know, I think it goes without saying that our priority should be on finding areas of common ground and areas where we are not engaged in zero-sum competition. Great, thanks. So, Katyana, I had a question for you. Um, in light of uh, Russia, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, which is not even 24 hours old, but you did lead with uh, sort of the Sino-Russian relationship as a source of tension in US-China relations. So I wanted to ask you how you see the Russian invasion um, impacting uh, U.S.-China relations uh, going forward? That is a very tough question, and I do not uh, pretend to be a um, expert on Russian foreign policy or Sino-Russian relations for that uh, matter. Um, and of course, I don't mean or I don't want to make it seem like Sino-Russian relations, uh, it, 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 the relationship itself is creating uh, a source of tension to um, the United States, but it does seeing that the more recent uh, joint statement might point towards something um, closer than what it was uh, in, in terms of uh, Sano-Russian uh, uh, relationship or to what extent they will uh, uh, cooperate in terms of defending or protecting their uh, core uh, interests. So my, my, my own guess is that it still remains unclear despite the statement, despite the clear language about um, against NATO expansion or uh, 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 against Taiwan independence, et cetera, which obviously are um, their respective core interests. It's still unclear to what extent the, the, there is commitment. Um, and uh, I, as I mentioned in uh, my earlier uh, talk, um, the Chinese foreign minister, at least after monitoring what they've been saying the past 20 hours or, or four hours or so, they they do not seem to want to take a side. They, they want to sort of step back uh, and, and just observe what's going on. So the foreign minister made the statement about um, uh, uh, Ukraine is an independent and sovereign country. And at the same time, the foreign ministry spokesperson um, said that Russia was back to a corner and therefore had to invade Ukraine. And on top of that, I think Hua Chunying, the Chinese foreign ministry spokesperson, said that China will not provide arms to either side, not to Ukraine nor to, to, to Russia. So it seems that um, China was 
if we're trying to project something beyond the joint statement in February, China was not really doing anything, at least at the moment. But of course, it could change in the future, uh, maybe in just the next day. But looking back on China's foreign policy behavior, it does not seem to me that it'll take uh, uh, in a step further. It, it seems always um, in, in the search for a Goldilocks choice or a Goldilocks kind of a, a solution to uh, these kind of um, uh, issues, especially since Ukraine, at least from my understanding, is not a major concern for China. Europe is just simply not China's core uh, concerns. Thanks. Uh, and Eric, I wanted to go back to one of your concluding points about miscalculation. And can you elaborate a bit more on what you think the most likely paths of miscalculation might be that could take uh, the US and China into a war? So I think there are you know, a variety of circumstances, really an inf infinite variety of things that could happen in various permutations and combinations. But uh, for example, I think China views uh, US relationships and propensity to, to involve itself in the events of allies and non-allies as being fundamentally different. Um, so it may feel, for example, that it can that it can undertake military action against a non-US ally with relatively little risk from the United States. Um, and I'm not 100% confident that the United States would not involve itself in a conflict, even with a non-ally, you know, were there to be uh, some sort of action in the South China Sea or some kind of blockade action or other military action by China. So that is one type of miscalculation. Another might be over Taiwan itself, if there were circumstances in which China viewed uh, US involvement as very unlikely. I mean, we've already seen dramatic uh, events on the world stage between the election of uh, D Donald Trump as president, um, Russia's invasion of uh, Ukraine, the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan, and how that played out. So, you know, given cer a certain sequence of events and a certain mood in, in the United States and among the public, uh, China might imagine that the United States would not involve itself when in fact um, the U.S. can turn and and then uh, disappoint China. So, you know, I think there are various paths uh, uh, that we could travel in which we would find ourselves uh, in in places that that neither side might predict. Um, uh, you know, it's probably a combination of different types of events that could really lead, lead to war and circumstances in which China felt that it didn't have any options, for example, on Taiwan, I think combined with miscalculation would, would be the most likely, likely avenue in my view. Great, um, thanks, Eric. So now I wanna to turn uh, to the questions from the audience that were put in the chat. Uh, not unsurprisingly, I think, given where we are today, a number of questions about uh, Ukraine and Taiwan. And so I'm going to try to group a few of them uh, together and then come back to each of you. And you can maybe pick or choose which thread here you want to pull on. But I think it's important to get these on the table. Um, and so I think a, one uh, Question concerns sort of the likelihood uh, that the Russian invasion of Ukraine will be a, a pretext or an opportunity for China to take some sort of action against military action against Taiwan. Uh, and then there's sort of a more general question about um, how uh, the response of the United States and uh, US allies uh, to Russian action will. Uh, shape or be viewed by China in the context of Taiwan? So does it change anything about um, Chinese uh, perceptions of how the US uh, might uh, respond? And so uh, let me turn both of those back to you. You can choose a, sort of to pull on one or the other thread here. And um, why don't uh, we start with uh, Kutian and then Ali and then Eric. 
Sure thing. Um, and I think they're definitely valid questions. Um, and I'll try to answer both of them briefly. So to the first question about whether China will use uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine as a pretext, um, I, 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 well, personally, I think probably not in the sense that um, China's red line, at least from what I can gather in regard to their current uh, documents, there at least needs to be a trigger in terms of a red line, um, or in terms of a, uh, for example, Taiwan declares judiciary independence or something like that. I I just think that without that, with without such a trigger, it, it's hard to imagine um, uh, Xi Jinping rationally will uh, uh, start an invasion of say Taiwan, regardless of what the Ukraine uh, situation is, just because Taiwan is a core interest for China, it's really important. And I think all, all of the decision making surrounding Taiwan, um, um, they're very careful. I, I, I don't think that um, uh, when it comes to Taiwan, China is opportunistic. That is just my personal view. And with regard to the second question about, um, uh, again, US response or lack thereof in the context of uh, uh, Ukraine and, and how or China reads that in regard to Taiwan. Um, I I personally wouldn't uh, read too much into uh, uh, China's perception of Ukraine and uh, linking that back to Taiwan, just because it it, it seems that um, Taiwan is different. Uh, where it, especially when it comes to U.S. priority, it, it seems to be the Asia Pacific region is more important than say Europe as it currently stands. Um, although I I, I do. Uh, or elsewhere, I did make the, the, the arguments that um, um, China does watch U.S. actions or lack thereof in regard to Syria or Ukraine and uh, derive their uh, uh, credibility in regard to South China Sea language recognition. So it's an article forthcoming at the Journal of Strategic Studies, but I don't think that that can be applicable to, applicable to uh, Taiwan. Okay, thanks. Ali. Thanks, Taylor. Um, yeah, I, I think I, I would reach to similar conclusions, but just sort of a few thoughts. I think the first one is, is just sort of a sort of a historical data point. I mean, there was this comparable discussion in 2014, and there was a concern that Russia's incursion into Ukraine and then its annexation of Crimea would would precipitate a sort of a Chinese uh, move on Taiwan, and we didn't see that. Now, I'm not saying that I'm not saying that the the failure of that linkage to obtain in the past. Sort of, I'm not saying that that means that that linkage wouldn't obtain now. You know, theoretically, but I do think it's worth noting that data point that in 2014 we didn't see that linkage. That would be point one. Um, you know, secondly, it's not clear that China's sort of course of you know pressure against Taiwan. It's not clear that it was sort of calibrated to the escalation of security tensions over Ukraine. And so, if you look at sort of the gradual intensification, sort of multifaceted uh, of uh, multifaceted Chinese pressure against Taiwan, uh, that intensification it had been growing long before the emergence of this. Uh, this particular crisis. So I think if you just look at the timeline, if you look at you know, sort of the timeline of Chinese pressure against Taiwan, that's a much longer timeline. And I think that that pressure had been accumulating in a much steadier clip. Whereas the escalation in Ukraine, the timeline is much shorter. And I think the intensification has been, you know, has been very, very sharp in a very uh, compressed period of time. So there's a mismatch between the timelines suggesting that you know, China's thinking about Taiwan, it's, it's not really sort of dovetailing with or, or aligning with what Russia is doing vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine. Um, and I guess the, you know, the third point, the, the third point that I would make on, on this linkage is that um, I think that, you know, I think that sort of China, it doesn't betray, I guess, a particular urgency uh, in, it, in its thinking about, there has been some thought about, you know, does China, you know, has China's leadership made, you know, rendered the judgment that it needs to make a move on Taiwan by, say, 2027 or by 2035? It's not clear to me that if you look at China's actions and statements that they betray a great urgency. Um, I think, and especially in 2022, um, I think that China right now is, is quite preoccupied with, with domestic politics. Uh, it just got through a very, very contentious uh, Winter Olympics. And so there was a lot of, I think there was a lot of focus among the Chinese leadership on, on getting through the Beijing Olympics, dealing with diplomatic boycotts, dealing with the possibility of an outbreak of COVID-19 within the Olympic bubble. So now, so now the Winter Olympics is gone, but now you have the 20th Party Congress coming up, and that's obviously a major, a major event in China's domestic politics. So my sense right now is that China's leadership, it's, it's, it's gotten through the Winter Olympics, it's looking ahead to the 20th Party Congress, it's thinking about how, um, you know, how it can, 
continue implementing this zero COVID strategy in light of this new highly transmissible uh, Omicron variant. So I think that China right now is quite focused on a range of internal challenges. It doesn't seem to me that China feels that now is is the time to uh, sort of to make a move on Taiwan, given those those domestic concerns. Um, and one last point that I would make sort of on the notion of you know credibility or resolve. We've seen we've seen some discussion saying that you know because you know the United you know, because you know the United States, its allies and partners uh, allowed uh, you know allowed you know Russia to you know to make a move on you know, Ukraine, that China is going to feel that you know, the United States and its allies and partners there, you know, they would allow China to do something similar. But one, I think that you know, most observers would, you know, would, would agree that the United States places greater strategic priority on, on Taiwan than it does on, on Ukraine. Um, and number two, um, I think that there's actually, if I would imagine that this thought has probably entered the minds of, of high ranking Chinese officials that um, if Washington feels if Washington feels that perceptions of its credibility have diminished in response to its response to what's going on in Ukraine, if China were to make a move on Taiwan, perhaps the United States would feel that much more of an urgency to respond than it would otherwise. And so it, there's this thinking that perhaps the United States might use a Chinese move on Taiwan to reestablish credibility uh, in response to a perceived lack of credibility or a diminution in its credibility uh, in responding to Ukraine. And so I, I think that that's a consideration that would also inform a certain restraint on on the part of China's leadership. So it's, it's all of a way of saying that I, I think that while I certainly understand why there's a narrative that connects what's going on in Ukraine with what could potentially go on in Taiwan, um, I think that Ukraine and Taiwan strategically are different. I think that the way that China thinks about Taiwan, it's not, the timeline is not calibrated to what Russia is doing. And so I, I think, yes, they are both very uh, pressing security challenges, but I, I think that it's important to, to differentiate between them as much as possible. So, Eric? Yeah, I would just add quickly, I completely agree with that assessment. Uh, I think it's, you know, highly unlikely that China would use this as a pretext. Uh, not only are the circumstances different, and I think they appreciate that, there's a much longer U.S., despite the lack of official diplomatic relations, there's a much longer history there. And despite strategic ambiguity, that sort of label, there's a clearer U.S. position on Taiwan than there is on Ukraine. Now, on the second issue, I think, you know, there is an interesting possibility here. What lessons would China take? And, and, I, and I really think that the more interesting question is what lessons is the U.S. going to take away from this? And will it take the right lessons away? Um, you know, I, I'm not sure it'll take the right lessons away. But as I mentioned, there's a fairly strong impetus now to do away with strategic ambiguity. Uh, you know, I don't think that would be wise, but I think this will greatly strengthen the hand of those folks who want to do that. I mean, there's already quite a bit of uh, enthusiasm for that on Capitol Hill. And that would be, um, you know, and I'm sure China is quite, quite concerned by that as well, which may make them quite torn in terms of how they actually think about this problem, uh, despite the fact that they're quite likely to, you know, in effect, provide cover or support for the Russian position officially. Thanks. That's, that's a very important point. Um, so, Eric, I'm going to come back to you with two, I think, related questions from the chat. Um, so the first is sort of asking about uh, the status of China's cyber war capabilities in terms of kind of its conventional, its overall conventional capabilities. And then second related question uh, has to do with um, sort of the effects of kind of or, or China's economy and the potential for hybrid sort of warfare kinds of approaches um, and, and whether or not uh, China would sort of be sort of strong enough perhaps economically uh, to uh, be able to, um, you know, in, engage in these kinds of uh, uh, techniques or practices in the future. So they're somewhat related, but a little bit different, but I thought I'd throw them both at you. Sure. So, um, uh, you know, on the cyber side, you know, the real answer is we don't know. Um, so China's cyber gets an enormous amount of attention, mostly because of its cyber spying. But there's a huge difference between cyber spying and operational cyber military capabilities, which are used, for example, to disable, um, you know, air defenses and, and, and have other sorts of effect. There's no doubt that China is quite capable, um, and there's no doubt that the United States, as all countries, you know, has vulnerabilities. So, for example, its um, 
ability to reinforce, you know, to flow forces is based on, you know, unclassified networks, those would be highly vulnerable to Chinese attack. And we might have to go back to pulling out a sheet of paper and a pen to, to you know, move stuff from point A to point B. China is equally vulnerable. Its, its supply lines are not quite as long, so the impact may not be as great. But I, you know, I wouldn't want to be operating China's railway during a major conflict with the United States, given the capability that the NSA has. Um, so you know, I think both sides have capabilities and vulnerabilities. Uh, as far as hybrid is concerned, I mean, that's a, that, of course, is a huge topic. I'll speak to one aspect of it, you know, when, so first of all, when you're going out of your country, it's a little bit harder to, to effectively mobilize, you know, your people's forces, right? Uh, people's militia at sea, for example. One of the capabilities that's often mentioned uh, is the ability to mobilize the civilian fleet for amphibious purposes, to, to lift Chinese soldiers, uh, for example, to Taiwan. So I've, you know, I've looked at that question in some detail. Uh, you know, China does have so-called row-row ships, roll on, roll off. Those, however, are mostly useful if you capture a port and they can pull into the port and offload, right? So then you can roll directly onto a pier. Um, but first you have to capture the port, that's not easy. And of course the Taiwanese can sabotage mine, uh, you know, the US can destroy the port facilities even after it's captured. So, you know, again, it's not a magic bullet. As far as landing amphibiously, actually crossing a beach, that requires a lot of equipment. So even if you use the civilian ships, you still have to offload or transload onto landing craft that then move to the beach. The British during the Falklands War found that offloading from their uh, civilian fleet, so they had a roughly equal number of civilian ships and military ships, that that occurred at one quarter or one fifth the speed of offloading purpose-built military ships. So it's not a terribly uh, efficient way to go about this business. And I think there's a reason that China is building military amphibious lift today. And there's a reason that it hasn't really conducted large scale exercises with these civilian ships. It's doing experiments, but it hasn't built the craft to, trans, to transload. Great, thanks, Eric. Um, Ali, there's a question here for you in the chat, uh, noting that you, you observe sort of a change in China's sort of strategy and narrative since uh, COVID-19 uh, burst onto the scene. So the question is, can you elaborate on that change um, and sort of what your sort of potential explanations uh, for the change are? Thanks. Thanks, Taylor, for the for the question. I think I think that there was a sense early on that, and then I should say that the narratives about so the COVID nineteen narratives, both in the United States, in China, globally, I mean, they've undergone so many shifts at this point that it's it's. You know, even though I, I talked in my, my remarks about narratives, I, I, I should acknowledge that the narratives themselves have changed a lot. But I think initially, um, if you sort of if you rewind the clock roughly sort of two years ago, so two years ago um, there was I, I think a pretty clear uh, narrative that had emerged. I think it had gained traction in the United States, it had gained traction in China. And I think it had a lot of resonance globally. And the narrative was that so this is circa you know, March 2020, April of 2020. And the narrative at the time was, you know, China has successfully contained uh, the first wave of the coronavirus pandemic within its own borders. The United States is, uh, meanwhile, is being uh, ravaged by this pandemic. You know, China is training its sites outwards. It's dispatching teams of doctors. It's shipping uh, kits full of personal protective equipment. Again, while the United States is kind of flailing and, and ham-handed in, in its domestic response. And so I think that that discrepancy in uh, perception of how China was doing in containing the pandemic, how the United States was doing, I think it really did feed this sense of this kind of ascendant sense of triumphalism. So I mentioned how I think that the sort of Chinese leadership has strung together certain data points. So the 2008 financial crisis, I think was an important inflection point. The, uh, I think the 2016 presidential election, which basically sowed doubt among US allies and partners about the stability of US foreign policy, sort of US investment in, in the international system, the bitterness, as I mentioned, of America's domestic politics. And then again, Amer sort of America's response to the COVID-19 Pandemic. So I think that there was a sense that uh, this sense that, okay, if we start putting together, you know, we have one now sort of additional data point suggesting that the United States really isn't able to 
to address its socioeconomic challenges at home? How is it going to be able to exercise effective global leadership if it can't even manage its own uh, problems at home? Uh, I think that that was one of the initial narratives. I think the problem is that China perhaps, I think in sort of the interval between sort of the onset of the coronavirus pandemic and now, I think that China has perhaps overreached and overextended. Um, I think that there were a lot, there are a lot of commentators who say that sort of, sort of March 2020, April 2020, um, China, if China had comported itself differently, it probably would confront a very different strategic, sort of external strategic environment. So I think that there are a lot of observers who say counterfactually, what if in March or April 2020, when China, when China was seen as doing very well in containing the pandemic and the United States was seen as flailing, you know, what if China had taken additional steps to stabilize its relationships with the other members of the Quad, so Australia, India, and Japan? Um, what if it had paused its coercive pressure against Hong Kong and Taiwan? Um, what if it hadn't sort of lashed out against critics of its response to COVID-19, but it had just tended to its own recovery? Um, I think that China would have been in a very different position. But I think now, as I, as I said earlier, I think that China's strategic situation, its external situation is actually more challenged now than it was prior to the pandemic. So it's not just the relationship with the United States that has deteriorated. Um, the European Union, I think, is, is talking about China in a way that would have been very difficult to imagine a few years ago. The Quad, it has a new lease on life. And so with the exception of Russia, so yes, the Sino-Russian relationship is certainly growing stronger. Uh, but otherwise, I think that China's relationships with most major powers, they either are stagnating or declining. So I think, I think that perhaps China interpreted that initial discrepancy between its COVID-19 response and that of the United States, but perhaps sort of overlearned from that discrepancy and I think overreached. Um, and I, I think now sort of has a, a pretty significant hole to climb out of in terms of restoring trust with, with most major powers. Great, thanks, Holly. Uh, Kachan, a question for you, um, which sort of asks, how do countries in Asia see China's assertive foreign policy posture? And to what degree does this sort of resonate with or work against uh, sort of U.S. Uh, views about uh, China? Wow, um, that is a very comprehensive question. It looks like a multi-volume dissertation project. Um, you, you should definitely do whoever asked the question. Um, I, I, I think it probably several things. I think first, it probably depends on the question that you're asking. Um, in the sense that um, uh, if by Asia you mean uh, uh, East Asia uh, in particular, then, uh, then there are countries who have a fairly good relationship with China because either they do not have territorial disputes with China or because they depend on China for economic um, uh, development. I think, for example, uh, Laos or Cambodia. Um, um, et cetera, they, um, I, I think they would very much be uh, in line with a lot of the policies that China would want them to take, especially when it comes to say, taking a stance on um, uh, territorial disputes in the South China Sea, or preventing ASEAN, for example, from reaching, uh, or from, from mentioning the South China Sea where uh, the disputes in their annual meetings, um, et cetera. Um, so that's the first kind of uh, 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 countries. Um, and the second kind of country would be uh, the countries that are more or less, uh, say, um, uh, uh, US allies or formal US allies, in, in which case they, they are not happy about um, China's coercive actions, be it in um, the uh, realm of territorial disputes or in the form of, say, economic sanctions uh, uh, or uh, uh, threatening its uh, citizens, et cetera. Um, so those countries will, I think, be more naturally aligned to policy positions of the United States. Um, but at the same time, they're, I, I don't think they would like to choose or pick a side in the sense that there are a lot of, that they're still exercising hedging strategies to a certain extent, especially um, going back to um, the um, um, economic aspect that Ali uh, talked about. It, China is, along with these Asian countries, um, are in a globalized production and supply chain. They do, uh, they do, to a certain extent, benefit from this um, uh, this supply chain. So, so they do not, at least from my view, they do not want. They're they're really exercising hedging strategies. So they do not want to. Uh, uh, um, I think uh, ally with the United States uh, or align their policies with the United States at the cost of. Uh, of say their, their economic relationship with, with China. Um, and I guess the third kind of 
country uh, uh, countries um, is those who are um, sort of good partners with the United States, but they're not formal allies. Maybe think Malaysia um, or uh, 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 some of the um, of Vietnam, for example. So their I think choices are a little bit similar to the second kind of countries in the sense that they're also hedging. Um, they do share with the um, U.S. allies in the region concerns about China's security policies, but at the same time, they do maintain uh, extensive economic ties and do uh, benefit from, say, China's Belt and Road Initiative uh, or, uh, or other kind of um, economic uh, projects. I'm not saying all of the Belt and Road Initiatives are uh, beneficial to these countries, but there are some who are definitely uh, useful for their local economy, et cetera. So I, I think it's a very complicated, complicated picture and um, uh, China seems to be in the process of um, uh, attempting a divide and conquer strategy like all great powers did in the past. Um, so it's hard to say uh, what is the overall uh, response from these countries because they all differ. And on top of that, their domestic politics will uh, matter, especially if there are, say, a democratic regime, think the Philippines, the Duterte, the Duterte regime is very different from um, the, their uh, predecessor, the, the Kino regime. So um, there are a lot of factors uh, going on here. Thank you, Katen. I think you've already started to write that thesis. Um, so uh, here's a question for each of you. Um, and you can I'm going to put it in two parts. You can choose one part or the other part or both. Um, so the question is, uh, what, what do you believe is the most sort of serious or important misunderstanding or misperception that each country's leaders have about the other? So what is China's biggest misperception about the United States? at the leadership level, and then conversely, what is the U US's biggest misperception about China at the leadership level? Um, and so uh, you can answer it from one perspective or the other or both, um, but it'd be great to get each of your, your views on this. And I guess going in uh, reverse order, we'll go back to Eric, since Katian spoke last, and give her a break. And uh, if er Eric would like to uh, pass, then we'll go on to, to Ali. So Ali, over to you. This this is a really, I think this is a really important question. I, I'm going to somewhat elide the question, I guess, just because it's it's it is such a good question and I can't think of a, a good answer, but it, it's more of a um, perhaps sort of a shared. I guess sort of a shared misperception or sort of a shared you know misapprehension, and so that's kind of my way of eliding a, a really really difficult um, you know question. I I would say that there is perhaps um, an under I think uh, an underappreciation of each other's resilience, and I think one of the reasons that there is that underappreciation is that um, I think that the United States it has I think a very formidable set of competitive advantages that China can't readily replicate, and I think that similarly. You know, China has some very powerful competitive advantages that the United States can't readily replicate. So, you know, China just in terms of its sheer scale, I think that you know a certain scale you know gives you just a certain weight in international affairs. Certainly, China's uh, its centrality in in the global economy, its centrality in global supply chains, its status as the world's largest exporting country, world's largest trading country. Um, you know, so, I think that there's sort of a range of Sort of economic advantages, I, I think also increasingly innovative uh, capacity. Um, and so uh, given, you know, given China's just economic you know, centrality, a lot of the talk about decoupling, disentanglement, I, I think that the rhetoric right now significantly outpaces the reality. Um, even for those countries that right now are thinking about decoupling in some substantial measure, that's not a short-term proposition. That's, you know, that's a medium to long-term proposition. So I think that from China's perspective, um, and also, I, I, one other advantage I should mention is just its um, its integration into the Asia Pacific's trading arrangements. So, I think that a lot of uh, America's sort of allies and partners are going to be looking very keenly to see what the Biden administration's forthcoming Indo-Pacific regional economic framework will contain, because the United States doesn't belong to RCEP, it doesn't belong to CPTPP, uh, and China touts its centrality to the regional trade agenda as a competitive advantage. You know, the United States, on the other hand. Um, it does undergird a post-war order that 
obviously, as we're seeing right now with the Russian invasion of Ukraine, that post war order is under growing strain from within and without. But it, it, has, it benefits from inertia. Uh, it benefits from the fact that it has grown substantially, both in terms of scope, geographic, and functional over the past eight decades. And orders, even as they're under strain, uh, they're not readily uh, they're not readily replaced. So I think that the United States it benefits from the sort of inertial uh, value of this international system that it's undergirded for the better part of the past three quarters of the century. A diplomatic network that again is under strain, but it's still very extensive. Uh, a, a community of democracies that again is under strain, but has grown roughly eightfold since the end of the Second World War. So it's kind of an apples and oranges comparison. But the point is that. The United States has formidable competitive advantages that China can't replicate and vice versa. And so what that means is that um, I think that if, if either country thinks that their relationship is going to take the form of a traditional power transition in which one country emerges victorious, I think that they're probably mistaken. And so again, it sort of comes back to this question of if we're not going to have a power transition, Washington is here to stay, Beijing is here to stay, uh, and they're fundamentally resilient, although they each have internal and external liabilities, what does the path forward look like? Great. Thanks, Ali. Um, would uh, Katana or Eric like to answer the question? Sure. Now that you've given me a time to think. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll just throw out two things. They're not terribly profound. Um, but I think, uh, you know, from the U.S. perspective, probably the greatest misperception is of unanimity within China, Chinese leadership among Chinese elites on foreign policy. So. You know, it's it's difficult to generalize here, um, and there's an odd pattern. Japanese analysts are often want to see divisions and factions everywhere in China, and I think probably exaggerate the extent of that. But in the U.S., we tend to see uh, China as a monolith. Now, part of that uh, derives from the type of uh, you know discourse we see in China under conditions where people are quite afraid now of you know the security services and 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 you know not want to um, to uh, cross um, Xi Jinping. Um, but I think there's you know quite a lot of disagreement. It is evident there's disagreement on major foreign policy issues like the extent to which China should lead or continue to maintain. Uh, low profile. Actually, I shouldn't use the word continue, but go back to maintaining a low profile. So I think that's probably the greatest uh, misunderstanding on the U.S. side. On the Chinese side, I'll sort of twist the question a little bit, and I I'll say, you know, there are probably others that may be greater than this, but one of their greatest, uh, I think, misunderstandings uh, really of the region rather than of the United States is that the U.S. leads and others follow. So I think this contributes uh, to Chinese suspicion of the United States and, and other regional states as well. Uh, you know, uh, Kuitian did a great job of illustrating the complexities of the region and regional positions, but I, I do think you can generalize to an extent and say that the countries of Asia have grown, you know, significantly more wary of uh, China's intentions uh, and activities over time, we could talk about specific cases, but in any case, I think that's generally true. And that has virtually nothing to do with the United States, um, you know, taking the lead and trying to, you know, quote unquote, make that happen. When the United States has tried to make that happen in the past, it has not been terribly successful. So this is something that is entirely in China's court. And, uh, you know, in many ways, it has, has fumbled the, the ball. To mix metaphors, yes. Uh, all right. Great, thank you. Katan, would you like to add anything to this question? Uh, yeah, very quickly, since we were right around at the 6 p.m. mark, um, maybe the first misperception on both sides is what I think is an exaggerated uh, uh, threat perceptions um, based on whatever issue areas they think are of their uh, concern. There are real concerns, security concerns, but it's, at the same time, I think the intentions are being read uh, in a much more accepted way as uh, they should be. And the second and related is, I think both sides have a fairly zero sum view of uh, uh, how international relations work, which is going back to the potential areas of uh, cooperation and some postal questions in the uh, in the box. And it, 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 it's, there are a lot of issue areas where both sides can cooperate. So it's not really a zero sum view. And, um, and I agree with Ali that 
um, economic decoupling has been the buzzword on both sides, not just the United States, including China, but empirically it's just, I think economists would say it's impossible. And that's probably a major empirical misperception. And finally, um, going back to um, uh, someone asked the question in um, the, the chat box about um, uh, the AAPI community here in the US and how what should they do? I think that really is related to some, not everyone, but some in the policy communities perception that every AAPI, every person in the AAPI community is a potential spy for the Chinese uh, Communist Party. We, we, we're definitely seeing something positive changes of a uh, mighty part of that, but um, but I think there are still quite a few in the policy community that holds that view, which um, I think is a misperception that can have um, negative policy consequences. Wonderful. Well, uh, many thanks uh, to all of the panelists, speaking personally as an MIT professor, it's been really wonderful to see uh, three MIT political science graduates uh, on the virtual podium today. I think we all learned a lot. Uh, to paraphrase Joe and Lai about the future of US-China relations, it may be too soon to tell, uh, but we certainly learned uh, more than uh, we knew at the outset of this session. So my thanks and gratitude uh, to Kutian, to Ali, and to Eric, and thanks to everyone uh, who's joined in to watch from wherever in the world uh, you joined us. Um, and just as a reminder, there are some future uh, star forums coming up, and the links are in the chat as well as uh, on the slides. So uh, thanks again, and good night.